Hey everyone, welcome to uh, track two of uh, today at Juneteenth, the Juneteenth Conf. I hope everyone has been enjoying all the sessions we've heard so far. Um, there's been a lot of great information, a lot of wonderful speakers. So, you know, we're just gonna keep the conversation going here in uh, track two. Next up, we're gonna have Ken Grandershon and also Dave, Dale Bowie, and they're gonna talk to us about Black Facts and the Wakandan uh, technology platform. So I'm gonna take a step back and I'm gonna let these gentlemen go ahead and take control. Thank you very much, Cecil. So my name is Ken Granderson, and that's what we're here to talk about. Black Facts and the Wakanda Technology Platform, as you can see, technology by us, for us, about us. And we have a pretty audacious statement here about creating the future of black history and leveraging technology to uplift the race. Um, you're gonna hear a whole lot about how I got into technology and things that I did as a black software developer. So I'm not gonna to get too much into my background at this point, as far as an introduction, other than to say that ultimately I, you know, am once upon a time was, you know, young black man, you know, kid from the hood in the neighborhood that was formerly called do or die bed A little different now, but that's, it is what it is. My, I'm the technology and vision side of the house and my main objectives are to show you examples of what's possible if you want to get on the idea of, of creating technology from a black perspective and to get you to think outside the box because i think you'll see things that no one else has been talking about or doing and ultimately to get you and inspire you to consider taking action to create something not just to be a user but a creator of technology dale and my name is Dale Dowdy, and I'm more of the business side of um, BlackFacts.com. Ken and I met years ago in college. He was a DJ, actually. Um, and he happened to be a Kappa, and I was a Sigma. Don't ask me how we ended up, you know, <laughs> wanting to be friends after all that uh, in the Boston area. But I was a hacker in high school, ended up going to BU, started my first company um, while I was in college. and. Ken and I and several of our friends became a part of a cadre of black technologists back in the 90s. And we've been working on numerous projects together over the years, one of which is a foundation project, which is blackfacts.com. And I'll jump in later on in the presentation and tell you a little bit about what we're doing today. All righty. So let me share a two minute story about something that happened in 1995 at the dawn of the information age. February is Black History Month, and today Red Sox all-star first baseman Mo Vaughn and the Boston Public Library unveiled a new CD-ROM, one guaranteed to enrich and inspire the lives of all children and adults. New Center 5's Pam Cross reports. The, the wooden golf tee was invented by a black Bostonian. Um, I, I didn't know that before I worked on the product. It looks like a computer game, but surprise, this is a history lesson. Boston's black history, to be specific. The creators, Inner City Software, took this 1992 book, authored by Robert Hayden, and transformed it to CD-ROM. I call them the MTV generation, and, you know, books aren't really uh, cool. You know, books aren't that popular. After, you know, playing with the program a little, they might, you know, take, go down to the library and actually get the book and look at that, too. You can find the program at some Boston library branches and at a few Shawmut Bank locations. They kicked in the funds. This is the Mo Vaughn Community Youth Center. You know, it shows other prominent, you know, black figures in this in this community that, that aren't athletes, that, that are just people who go out and do a good job of what they're doing. I like that. They teach you a lot of things that I can't find in my history book in school. Like, it shows me a lot of things that I won't find in the history book. Touch screens are also in use at the Children's Museum. Vision Computers donated these units, but any school already equipped with computers can share the wealth. Inner City Software is giving them to any school in the metropolitan Boston area that can run the software. I mean, in any youth center or program. African American history as close as a keystroke. The facts are the same, but now they're available at the touch of a button. In Dorchester, I'm Pam Cross from Center 5. February is Okay, so <clears throat> the 350 Years of History program was publicly displayed at the Boston Public Library and the Children's Museum 
on touch screen kiosks. It was in the news and demonstrated on local television, um, even presented it at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture in Harlem. But unfortunately, after two years of meetings with the school system due to politics and the fact that none of the schools in the black communities were, had CD-ROM capable computers, it never got into the school system. And I don't know if you guys noticed our Black Facts, black Facts Matter t-shirts. This is what some of the kids were wearing. We made these um, you know, when we did demonstrations at, at the schools. And that's what the program uh, looked like. 1995. So now, word of warning, you're about to see a whole lot of images and examples to follow. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to mention them very briefly and move on. If you're interested, everything I'm about to show you is available online. But right now, I just want to give you some food for thought about what being a black technologist can look like. So the story really starts several years earlier when I was working as a software tester at a company called Phoenix Technologies and decided to get into programming. I asked the folks at Phoenix if I took coding classes, would they reimburse me? They said, well, you're a software tester and we're more of a hardware company. So they said, no, okay. So I asked them if we could amend my employment agreement so that they would not have any rights on anything I built. And they said, yes, okay. So I purchased two books. Programming Windows 3.0 by Charles Petzold and Windows 3, a developer's guide, and I taught myself how to code in C and C++. I started putting out programs on the dial-up bulletin board systems that preceded the internet. Just keep in mind, this is 1992. From what was then called shareware, which today would be close to freemium. Try it, and if you like it, you can buy it. And this is before people were kind of expected to get software for free. So I got on the map with a desktop customization utility Windows 3.0 called NoDOS that made Windows a little easier to use. When that feature was included in Windows 3.1, I did another one called Group Icon, which ended up in several books in the US and at least one in France. Group Icon got included in this book, Windows Gizmos, which was sold across the country, and it resulted in 2,000 registered users at $20 a piece. My salary then was $43,000, so I quit my job at Phoenix and started doing software full time under the company named Inner City Software, which was the euphemism for black software company. And of course, the perfunctory Inner City Software t-shirt, right? The help file for Group Icon was like me, unapologetically black. And the Windows Gizmos book printed it verbatim, including these thank yous for the inspiration shout outs to not only Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, but to Elijah Muhammad and Minister Farrakhan, who at the time was filling stadiums across the country with unapologetically black messages of black self-love, self-sufficiency and empowerment that led to the Million Man March of 1995. As I left Phoenix on very good terms and they had started getting into the consumer software market when they realized what I knew how to do now, they actually hired me back as a consultant at twice the um, rate that I was getting paid as an employee. And I helped him work on this product, Phoenix Facts. And I'm gonna show you a picture that's from the inside cover. In Phoenix Facts, I created a little uh, Easter egg, which, uh, yeah, you can't really see it that well. Maybe you can see it where in the address book, that's my mom's name, Eileen Grandison, and she's working for, wait for it, Malcolm Exporting. So I was making sure that, you know, was leaving breadcrumbs if nothing else. I realized that this brave new world of technology had no old boy network to get in my way. Neither did it require access to capital to pay for licenses, buildings, and staff in order to get products out there. So I established inner city software with the goal of broadcasting both inside and outside the black community that the computer age represented the closest thing ever to a level playing field and that there were smart black folks who would be part of this new economy. And the image on the right is actually circa 1997, showing some of the trainings we were doing for local nonprofits and National Society of Black Engineers. Inner City Software became the tech company in Boston's communities of color. And we put dozens of local organizations and businesses online 
from black businesses like the New England Black Pages and the Black Newspaper Bay State Banner to allied organizations like Boston Foundation, Northeastern School, University School of Education, and the Nellie Mae Education Foundation. We also did the websites for black organizations in other areas like Baltimore's East Harbor CDC and the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation in DC. I also did technology awareness presentations in Connecticut, New York, and as far as Florida, the Blacks in Government, Association of Real Estate Brokers and the Broward Alliance, and, and I mentioned before, National Society of Black Engineers. In the quasi-public and private sector, did websites and other tech work for a bunch of community economic development organizations and the venture capital firm Bessemer Venture Partners, but for some reason was never able to secure external financing from any of them. By 1996, the internet was starting to expand outside the realm of the world of nerds, and I realized that the internet was going to be another game changer, and not just for techies this time, but for everyone. So the obvious thing to do was gather up all the black tech folks I knew to help me put together websites for Boston's communities of color under the name Inner City Access. We gathered the information, we recruited some young folks to create some graphics, we built the HTML pages, and we hosted it on the high speed, for the time at least, uh, internet connection of a local black networking company, and we launched Inner City Access for Black History Month 1996. And yes, that picture there is a nine-year-old boy who did part of the presentation of um, Inner City Access, and you'll get to see him in the second of two videos that I want to share with you. Keep in mind, again, this is 96. Some of Boston's minority neighborhoods are going online for the first time through a new website called Inner City Access. It's part of an effort to make sure the minority community isn't overlooked by the information age. New England cable news reporter Audrey Leganis has the story. Far above the city streets, Boston's minority communities are clicking clicking with the sounds of computer keyboards. It's part of an outreach project to get Boston's black neighborhoods online. Job requirements getting higher and higher. Computer literacy is being, it's becoming a requirement in areas and industries where it was not before. And if um, anyone wants to make sure that they are going to save themselves from being part of a permanent underpass, you've got to get you know, your feet wet in there. Ken Granderson is an MIT graduate and the owner of a computer software company. He and a group of supporters have created Inner City Access, a new website for Mattapan, Roxbury, and Dorchester. We think that it's really, really important, and especially for people of color who have gotten into the mindset of thinking that, oh, you know, we can't do because, you know, we're locked out. We're not locked out of this. It's open. The chance for communities all over America and all over the world who feel that they've been underrepresented to suddenly say, hey, look, there's something out there that's pertinent to us. The organizers of Inner City Access point out that the internet is perhaps the most colorblind form of communication in the world today. It doesn't matter when you're online what your racial or ethnic background is. What's important is your product, what you have to say, and the fact that you're connected. <laughs> The founders of Inner City Access say it's uncertainty, not a lack of money, that keeps members of the minority community from learning about the internet. The knee-jerk reaction is uh, for people to think that it's money. It's not money. Um, there are many, many people in the minority community who have the equivalent, the financial equivalent of computers sitting in their living rooms in the form of televisions, VCRs, stereos. The problem is, is that Computer technology has not presented itself as being important, as important as what's on the TV. Granderson says it's especially important to get young people online, people like nine-year-old Ian Harris, who likes his computer better than his TV. I think kids can learn from computers. Usually if you can learn from computers, I think that, that would be a good thing because you can discover stuff out there in the world like you never seen before. The founders of Inner City Access say they'll continue to reach out to young people like Ian and to the rest of the minority community to make sure they don't get bypassed by the information superhighway. In Boston, Audrey Laganis, New England Cable News. Some of Boston. So, to do the HTML for the Inner City Access project, I wanted to use this awesome HTML editor by Vermeer Technologies called Front Page. Front Page was so good that Microsoft went and bought the entire company 
when I was about to purchase front page, which was a good thing because Vermeer was selling it for $500. But when Microsoft learned what I was using it for, they let me get it for half price. After the acquisition, I was helping so many people with front page and the Microsoft developer forums that they made me a Microsoft most valued professional. There's no way to tell for sure, but I've always guessed I was probably the first black MVP. Being an MVP gave me access to all of Microsoft's tools, including the SQL Server database. So I taught myself how to do database programming now and launched Black Facts Online for Black History Month 1997 with the goal of helping the Black online community see that they were fully included in this brand new internet thing. And this, this is gonna be 1997 Black Facts buttons, similar to these are our new ones, our Black Facts Matter buttons. So besides being in the internet's first Black History Encyclopedia, Black Facts was a pioneer in implementing APIs because if you can look at the bottom left of the inner city access screen, you can see it referring to Black Facts. We actually let you look at Black Facts from inner city access. About, somewhere around 97 to 99, I worked with Boston's Empowerment Zone and built a business directory to put all the Boston Empowerment Zone businesses online, as well as a site that ran the Empowerment Zone itself. This is a favorite project of Vice President Al Gore. So when he came to town to meet with the Empowerment Zone folks, he got to present the site to them and he shook my hand. It seemed like a nice guy. By 2000, I had a small staff and I had taught them to do database web programming so we could put our neighborhood of Roxbury online at roxbury.com with local news, events, business listings, subject matter expert articles, and community discussions. It so happened at the same time that Gail Snowden, a local black banking executive, decided to do a community technology education and access project in Roxbury. Roxbury.com became the perfect answer to making sure that graduates of their community link program had someplace relevant to go once they learned about computers and got a free computer. So I negotiated a one-year license with the bank to use Roxbury.com for $150,000. For local news, I built a custom content management site for the black newspaper in Boston, the Bay State Bank. And I did that for them for free in exchange for letting me pull the content that they posted as news to populate the news section for Roxbury.com. And there is a cable news story on YouTube about it, but it's six minutes long and the audio is horrible. So I'm just gonna show you a few screens from Roxbury.com. There's also two presentations on Roxbury.com at my personal site, KenGranderson.com. So these are some screens and keep in mind, this is 2002. And what you're gonna see here is 100% conceived, created by myself, coded by myself and my crew of black software developers. Um, Jose Cabrera out in LA, we use him for a lot of our design work. He did the designs. No third party frameworks or platforms because we build frameworks and platforms for ourselves and others to use, which is why when I see folks get all hyped up about things like black Twitter, I look at it a little sideways because I don't understand why people don't realize there's no reason you can't build your own Twitter. But anyway, lightning round coming up because I got I want to get to the demos and stuff. The deal. Roxbury.com homepage, local news, local events, event details posted by a local organization from one of the weekly Thursday night meetings we did for training sessions. This is four years before Eventbrite was launched. Local business listings, 2002, two years before Yelp was launched. Business details, anyone who's in Boston, um, you know, and likes soul food would remember Bob the Chefs. Community experts, which today they would call blogs, and online community discussions, two years before Facebook started. Community discussions were driven by the 6,000 member strong email listserv I ran called Boston Blacks Online. I've been running that since 1996 after the shutdown of the Afro-American culture forums that I managed on CompuServe. Some of that is described in this 2019 book, Black Software, the Internet and Racial Justice from the Afronet to Black Lives Matter, which is um, written by uh, Professor Charlton McIlwain at NYU, and that's available actually hardcover, and I just got the audio book too. So the summary on Roxbury.com, this is one of our urban communities online 18 years ago. We did this soup to nuts. We didn't ask anybody for permission. We did not need anyone to approve it. We decided to do it and we did it, period. This next slide is intentionally left blank. 
But I stated earlier in 2002, we licensed the platform builtforroxbury.com for $150,000. However, the emergence of free content management uh, system platforms like WordPress essentially destroyed the custom CMS market opportunity and globalization cut on um, development billing rates by 50%. So after 12 years, I sadly shut down inner city software in 2004. Um, but the good news is that my former developers moved on to, um, out of the three of them, one became a career software developer for a mainstream company. Another um, became a tech consultant out of the UK, who well, helped the Caribbean nation of St. Lucia establish their policies around electronic information. And the third is a developer now of a leading point of sale product for the cannabis industry in Oregon. Speaking of St. Lucia, uh, so after inner city software, I had stepped back from doing my own projects for a while and did everything from working on a smoking cessation online community, working for Hewlett Packard, and I built several sites, a social networking site, a custom text messaging platform, and enhanced online recommendation engine for a longtime friend, who also happens to be black, who's launched and purchased several tech ventures. I also work with Dale on several projects, including a web-based scheduling and shop management system for barbershops and beauty salons, a web-based project management system for a major insurance company, and a scholarship management system for an organization that did scholarships for the beauty industry. Around 2013, one of my former employees, who is St. Lucian, um, was consulting for the government when the need came up for them to have a good website. So she, and that's right, she was one of my developers in the 90s, connected me to the government, and I architected, built, and stood up the official website for the government of St. Lucia, which is a custom content management system that their various ministries use to publish news, documents, directories, contract announcements, and so on. Basically, towards the end of every year, Dale and I would start thinking about next Black History Month and what we would do with Black Facts, which had been running continuously, but basically unsupervised. And in 2017, we decided to, quote, reboot Black Facts with a new look, a new platform providing new functionality and new goals, far more audacious than simply making sure that Black folks saw themselves reflected on the internet. So today's Black Facts has the big, hairy, audacious goal of nothing less than changing the way that Black history and culture are cataloged and preserved for the future by doing the following, collecting our stories and news digitally, organizing our stories using artificial intelligence, publishing our stories to any device, and then saving our stories forever for future generations. When I say collecting our stories digitally, our platform can pull content from a variety of sources. Like the bottom says, just get it to an electronic device, we can take it from there. With AI, we are application and platform developers, not AI experts. So we leverage existing AI engines to build connections between content items, and our platform is flexible enough to consume data from any AI engine that provides an API. And when I talk about publishing stories to any device, once it's in our system, we can deliver it. We are delivering it, excuse me, because I'm a stickler about, I'm not talk, I have receipts. Everything I talk about, we can demonstrate because we get it done. <laughs> and we, can deliver, we are delivering it through a variety of channels, including the Blackbacks website, mobile devices, widgets on third-party websites like this. This is a third-party radio station and via email, like our daily mailing, we call the Black Facts of the Day. Final point, saving our story for future generations. We view our platform as a game changer because while in the past, much of our history has been lost because libraries burn, all griots die, and history books are generally written by the colonizers. However, we own all of our intellectual property and are committed to making it available to the academics, the journalists and other storytellers who are the ones who are capturing Black history as it unfolds, but they just don't know how to leverage technology like we do. And so we're uniquely positioned to quote, create the future of Black history with our platform by simply doing what we are already doing just at a larger scale. And we're doing it without asking anyone because we are in control this time. And with that, I'm going to hand the mic over to my good friend, and partner in various ventures for 20-something years, Dale Dowdy. 
So, as Ken has talked about, BlackFacts.com has had a 23-year evolution and it's continuing. In 1997, we were simply a text-based uh, website delivering content, and I believe we actually sent out text messages through an SMS service of giving people a fact of the day um, where you were you would receive a text kind of inspirational saying, today in Black history, this thing occurred. Well, from 2000 to 2017, we rose from obscurity organically to becoming number one on all three search engines. There's actually an Amazon skill right now that you can add to Alexa, that when you say, hey, Alexa, what's going on today? It will tell you the weather, the news, and what's happening in Black history. And this is a free skill that if you have Alexa, you can actually access this directly. By growing organically, somehow we went from nothing to now we have over 50,000 facts. We have a social media reach of almost 500 million. We have 500,000 email lists. And we're introducing this week as part of our Juneteenth effort, um, the Wakanda News, which is our um, black news syndicate. And we've been promoting a sneak peek of that for the past five days. And that sneak peek has already had 1.82 million um, impressions and an engagement level of over 80,000. So we know that the platform that we have built and have developed organically can actually get out to reach the target audience around the globe. So what is our strategic plan? Well, for the past few years, we've just been kind of fumbling around and pulling things together, but we do have a plan um, going forward uh, the next three years where we're looking to first increase our content and tracking of demographics in terms of what people are doing on the website outreach and membership services we're just introducing membership because remember for almost 20 years black facts was just a free site that we didn't ask you to do anything you came to the site and you found out about black history you could search and explore it but that was all we've never tried to gather information or present you with information we have begun working with um, a number of schools and we have some pilot programs with NYU and some HBCUs and some of that I'll be showing later on. And our big goal is to actually leverage the technology that we've built to make that available to the black community. So what is the Black Facts operating model? Well, we get content from various sources um, whether they are digital griots who are basically storytellers that, that are bloggers um, or we're pulling content from different sites. We then actually aggregate and cross-reference all that content. We get information from sponsors that want to say, hey, this Black History Moment was brought to you by, and they get tagged with particular facts. And then we deliver the content on various platforms. We even have widgets that can be pushed out onto your website so you can plug it into your website and we have real live websites today, radio stations and others that get the black history fact of the day by plugging in a simple line of JavaScript um, into their website. And now they get every single day new black history facts. And we'll be expanding that with black news shortly. As I mentioned, for Juneteenth, we actually wanted to roll out what we're calling Wakanda news. We basically began gathering news from over 150 sources around the globe. Uh, sources that are both U.S. and the continental Africa and throughout the Caribbean. We expect to add more content sources over time, but we feel like we've pulled together enough sources that we could make it available because, as we know, fake news seems to be a popular term. We wanted to present black news, news that was important to people of color. That doesn't mean that it's just news about people of color, but it's news that our audience and our demographic would be interested in. And we allow our members to eventually not only to come to the site and check out the latest news, but you'll be able to subscribe to news of your preference and have that delivered to you on whatever platform works for you. And I'll be demoing that a little bit later on as well. As part of what we've been doing, not just now, but for the entire time that we've been working together and all the time that I've known Ken, is we really wanted to empower our community. And as you've seen in some of those early videos, you know, we were trying to get technology as a tool accessible to, you know, people of color from 1997 until today. And what we've been doing is we've not only been building these 
platforms for ourselves, but we're trying to figure out how do we make them available um, so that others can consume them because all too often we get caught up in using someone else's tech, someone else's solution. And that doesn't mean that we necessarily have to have everything hosted, you know, finding a black company to host a cloud solution. But that does mean that we can own our own intellectual property and make that available. And the Wakanda Technology Initiative is specifically focused on the idea of what the Wakandans did, which was they empowered their own people through the use of superior technology. We believe that we have that superior technology. We've been showcasing it throughout this presentation and through the many uh, contracts and relationships we've had over the years. And now we're trying to figure out and leverage that technology to help our own people to be able to embrace it and utilize it for their own businesses and other solutions. So what is the Wakanda Technology Initiative and how does it work? Well, basically, if you have an existing website, you'll be able to plug in different widgets and tools, whether it's uh, appointment booking or displaying different contents, much in the same way that you can, you know, right now go on WordPress and get a, a particular template. Well, we're offering different sets of tools that will be available to for you to plug into your own website or to stand up your website on our platform. We intend to offer it as a freemium subscription. So it's basically free for the basic service and then you can add solutions over time. The key is that this is our technology and the businesses that you'll be sharing news and content and displaying ads for will be businesses in urban communities around the globe. We're gonna be focusing on rolling something out as a pilot program to a number of schools and we're doing a pilot right now with NYU and we'll show you a little bit about what we're doing but our real goal is to empower our people with technology tools that can be available at a price that makes sense for them. Because many small businesses either don't know how to, le to leverage technology in a way that makes sense for them, or they realize, hey, I can't afford it. Or they have their cousin TT who throws together something and then forgets all about it because they don't really have skills and that's not their specialty. We have de developed the solutions and packaged them in a way that it can be readily delivered and we're hoping in the next few years to begin rolling that out across the country. The big picture is this. We have blackfacts.com, which is already number one in all the search engines. And if you know anything about the internet, you know, the internet is like an ocean. Your web page can be a drop of water or it can be an island or it can be a continent. In our case, Black Facts is not really a continent, but let's call us a coral reef, you know, we're definitely a way station for people who are looking to get some fun in the sun and are related to people of color. They know to come to Black Facts, and if they search for it, they will find our site. We expect that with the Wakanda news that we're going to be rolling out and the Black Facts news syndicate, that we are going to be number one in Black news by the end of this year. We have really put a lot of work into this, and we're excited about making this available to the general public. But what we've found is that it's about awareness. Our audience, for the most part, has been mostly students and educators. Students, because during Black History Month, they've got to do a Black History project. And when they search for Black History, they find us. Educators, because they want to actually share Black History with their students. And now parents, you know, Black parents are coming to the site and saying, hey, we want to make, you know, Black History re relevant. And now with all the protests and things that are going on, that makes us even more relevant. The fact that our history is being lost but we are in the process of trying to make sure we can preserve that forever, online, digitally. So what are the things that we've been doing with the Wakanda Technology Initiative that are actual real projects? And some of these I'm going to be demoing um, and I'll be flipping off the presentation in just a moment. We've set up a pilot program for a marketplace where we're selling black products from particular vendors and we expect to call that Wakanda marketplace and expand that in the coming months as we offer uh, products and services from black businesses around the globe. We have already been working with um, New York University and their faculty resource network, which is actually a, a conglomerate of small colleges and universities, many of them being HBCUs that leverage the, the I guess, financial and reach of NYU to be able to give services and training to their faculty that they never had before. And their site is actually sitting on Black Facts and live today. We're in the process of, of putting up sites for all of the Divine Nine, so all the Black Greeks, so that we can actually showcase our Black Greeks and what they've done 
um, and, and their influence on history that will be available on Black Facts by the end of the year. And of course, you know, we've already been working with HBCU, some of them that are part of uh, the, the program that we have with NYU. And some of them are just HBCUs that we're reaching out to directly saying, hey, listen, you are also a part of Black history. And as a part of our goal of preserving our history and culture, we want to make sure we preserve what you have done and what you have contributed to history. And so we're making sure we put some of them online with dedicated pages specifically for those HBCUs. Our library of Black Facts has over 50,000 articles and growing. And we know that that includes many distinguished graduates from HBCUs. But we're putting pages dedicated to those HBCUs because we know they're going to be suffering, especially due to coronavirus. And we want to make sure they get as much visibility and celebration of what they have done and how they've contributed to history as possible. And the reality is our work with education has taught us one thing. School sites are usually only visited by people going to those schools. So if you are a student, you might go to the school website. But if you're in the general public, you're not really finding out what the school has done, what its place in history is, who the distinguished graduates were of those schools. But if you come to Black Facts, you can find out all of that. And that's what we're trying to do on our platform. Now, let me take one second and shut this down so that I can actually show you some real live demos of the products that we have in place. Is my screen up? Yep. All right. So this is blackfacts.com. Basically, every day that you come to Black Facts, you will see a, a series of showcase facts of the day. And then you'll see, you know, different facts. Uh, we have like uh, little widgets that give you uh, that you can take a spin about a particular topic and it will kind of take you through different things around that topic. And you are able to click on any one of those and find out the specific information about that person based upon whatever the topic is. The site is completely searchable. Um, and it's available and free for anyone to actually go on the site and explore. And we encourage everyone that is participating in this event to take a look and see what you can find out. It's amazing how much you can learn. What we do know is that Black Facts is one of the most sticky sites on the internet. And what stickiness means is that when people come to the site, they actually explore the site. According to Google's own statistics, people that actually go searching for a site on the internet stay on that site about 30 seconds. If they go to a site that they already know, the average stay on that site around 90 seconds. On Black Facts, our visitors stay on the site four minutes and 20 seconds. That means that Black history is something that people care about, that it connects to them, that all the content that we have, they want to explore and they get a chance to learn something new every time they come to the site because every day we bring new content. This is uh, a sample of the Wakanda Marketplace, some of the products. We actually have been working with Black Sands. They, they created a Black comic book series. We're really excited about that. We did a promotion for them. It reached two and a half million people in only like three weeks of promotion because they were captivated by the fact that there's actually anime that are created by people of color. And we know that there are others that do this as well, and we hope to incorporate them over time. This is our Wakanda news site. We've just released that as part of our Juneteenth offering. If you go to blackfacts.com slash news, you're able to go to this page. It brings up news from all of our different news sources that are cross-referenced um, um, and indexed through our AI platform, but it allows you to also specifically go to news in the USA or Africa or Caribbean depending upon what your preference is. And that's based upon the fact that our audience is really focused on these particular areas. And we expect to add content over time on any one of these different areas. And our news engines actually pull in content continuously. And so you'll see every time you come to the site, there'll be new news, new topics of, um, of discussion for you to review. But we also try to indicate the flag of the country flag for where the news is coming from. Um, where the sources of, of the particular content. It is searchable, so if you do a search for something like Juneteenth, you'll actually pull up all the news that we have in our archives that are related to Juneteenth. We have a little animation of historical figures that's part of our cycling and waiting um, process as it loads. 
here's the results for the Juneteenth search. It talks about activities that are happening today, but also have happened in the past. And we're really excited about the fact that we're able to make this available to all of our customers. We did a promotion for this particular service, and it has just been amazing, the amount of response. Some of it actually not that good because people are like, hey, wait a minute, black news, well, what about Latino news or Asian? And then we're like, well, we're black. So, you know, and we're not apologizing about being black. This is why we're called Black Facts. Um, so it's been interesting to see how people have been responding. Um, this is our dashboard, which is our administrative dashboard. I'm just giving you a, a clue in. We have a number of tools that allow us to manage the complexity of the system and show the activity that's happening. And we can you know, filter activity by day, by week, by month. Uh, one of the interesting things that we're always aware of is how many fact views, this particular purple item. So, so far this month, we've had over 117,000 fact views. We typically can reach millions of fact views per month depending upon what happens in during Black History Month, everything explodes. Now, I, I mentioned some things that we were working on that I wanted to showcase for you. We're working on a showcase site specifically for Harvard University because Harvard has a project that is talking about Harvard University and their, in, um, and their impact with slavery and Black culture. And so we're actually doing a special project for them. They've been one of our clients in the past. And we're going to be showcasing with Harvard University fa the diversity of their faculty and staff. And that's something that we plan to roll out um, sometime in August, but we're pulling that together right now. We have begun modeling um, sites that we want to do for Black Greeks. I happen to be a Sigma, so of course I'm showcasing the Sigma site. But um, we're going to have sites for all of the Divine Nine. We have the AKA site. Um, we want to showcase the history, the contributions, what they stand for, what they've done in the past, and what they're doing now. And all of this is going to be driven by our AI engine pulling content that is relevant about this particular topic and making making it visible and showcased on this site. So when people come to Black Facts and search for something about any one of the Divine Nine, they're able to pull up real content that is happening right now that they're involved with and allow, allow them to be redirected to find out more and participate in those programs if they would like to. Um, this is Delta Sigma Theta. Um, we also have, you know, in, in homage to, uh, to Ken, we do have uh, the campus. Um, so again, we're really excited about what we've been able to do and the things that we're working on, but it's not just about the fact that we're building technology that is showcasing black culture and and black achievement. We're working on something that is really special. This Swagger site is actually part of our toolkit. And we're putting together a toolkit for all those people that went to Code Camp and they learned how to use everything, you know, from uh, Ionic to React or whatever tool set they went to camp and learned about. They know that all these camps, you know, talk about uh, using different APIs. So we have an entire library of all of our quote unquote, our Black Facts and Wakanda APIs that will allow anyone who is a developer to be able to pull Black content and make that a part of their platform, whether it's a mobile platform, web platform, whatever you're developing. If you're going to Code Camp and you want to showcase Black history, we are going to be releasing all of these APIs so that you can find out and pull sample code. This is the API for our fact of the day. So you're able to pull in the fact of the day and display that on your particular site. All of this is stuff that we're gonna make available to those people that are in our community because we're not only wanting to showcase what we have done, we want to use our technology so that others in our community can actually build and grow on their own solutions, their games, their their websites, their models, their news sites, whatever it is you're building, if you want to be able to pull content that is relevant, you want to show news on your website, you don't have to go and pay anyone for a news subscription. You can come to us because we're pulling the news that's relevant to your people and you're able to showcase that using the API platforms that we've put together so far. I have a couple others that I'm quickly going to go through. This is like Crystal Ray High School, which is one of the high schools that we're partnering with because we're basically, as I say, we're the educational platform is one of our real you know, uh, winners here because so many uh, schools are no longer teaching black history and we're finding more and more schools that are in urban communities want to showcase what they're doing. 
We're working with uh, the Herman Schreider um, uh, 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 um, Elementary School. It's the elementary yeah, school yes, in New yes, York. 79 in Canarsie. In yeah, it, it, it's in Brooklyn. So we're working with them. We're going to be putting them on Black Facts and putting them online as well. Um, their principal is really excited about this project, and this is something that you know that we think is just part of giving back to our community, but also giving them something relevant that they can use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, this is Morehouse, Tuskegee, Howard, all the HBCUs, we're in the process of putting them online. The last thing that I want to quickly go through is, um, this is the Faculty Resource Network site um, that NYU has. They have a number of members, like Xavier University is one of the HBCUs, um, NYU, all of their member universities are showcased on here, all the different programs that they've been involved with, this is actual technology that's built on the Wakanda Technology Initiative. Everything that we've done here, when you choose to go to, you know, like Wagner College and you want to see what their institution is about, all the content that they've provided us for Wagner College actually becomes available and is fed, it's data driven. Everything about Blackbacks, our site is not static. The reason why we became number one in all the search engines is because every time you go to the website. I don't mean that every time you go for a particular day. I mean, every single session that you go to on Black Facts shows you new information. And because of that, it's new and relevant information. That means our site is constantly updated because it's entirely data driven. This is the type of functionality and tech capability that we're offering now to Wagner, to the other HBCUs that are part of the faculty resource network. And they are really excited about this. We have a number of other platforms we're building out for um, uh, for them. One, of, the last one is, I think this one is the, the a community portal. Um, NYU and another and a number of these other HBCUs are looking to get tenured black professors. You know, there's always the hey, I couldn't find anyone of color who was qualified for a particular job. So NYU has a specific program called Faculty First Look that takes graduate and postgraduate students and educates them on the steps they need to take. And it actually pays for them to come to NYU and go through this curriculum. Um, so it doesn't cost them anything. So they can learn how to become tenured at universities around the country and around the globe. And we're putting this community site online, again, using our Wakanda Technology Initiative technologies. And I think we're now in the last 10 minutes. So we're in the questions and answer session. Oh, oh, can we just do the last slide then? Put oh. the last slide up or go to my screen or... Yeah. Um. Yes. Um, anyone that's on participating in this particular event or on this stream of, of today's event, if you send an email to Juneteenth at blackfacts.com, you will end up getting a free um, gold level membership of Blackfacts, which gives you much more access than our normal uh, free membership. Um, our gold level membership is usually um, uh, two Tubmans, uh, <laughs> uh, $40 per year. Um, but we'll we'll be giving that away for free for anyone who sends an email to Juneteenth at blackbacks.com. And we also have some, um, we, we have a relationship because we are rolling out some adult learning um, skills because with with this whole coronavirus, we know that people are out of work. And as people try to go back to work, maybe their career path is not the one that's gonna work for them. Maybe they can't go back and get a job at a restaurant. So we have a library of over 7,000 online classes that have full curriculums that can take you through everything from learning how to do agile to uh, PMP certification to programming on different languages and platforms, basically, how do you refresh your skills before you get back in the job market? We think that's very important to our people of color because many of us are the ones that are suffering, not having jobs. And so that's a platform that we're going to be working on. And anyone that sends an email to Juneteenth at blackfacts.com will get a free sample where they can go through some free courses on that platform. But that's something we'll be rolling out later this summer as well. Thank you very much. I know you've had a long day. This conference has been fantastic. Yep. And you know, what? one closing thought. One before we do questions is that inclusion is such a buzzword these days. Inclusion, if you think about it, though, is only needed 
if you have not created your own. The only thing I ever asked from a mainstream tech company was for my former employer to not stand in my way while I did my thing. So while you're supporting initiatives to push for more diversity and inclusion in technology, also remember that the only thing stopping you from creating your own technology is not doing it. And that's it. Great. Well, hey, thank you to both for that, that very thought provoking and, and really interesting history lesson too into some really cool technology. Um, you know, my family's from the Caribbean. I was born and raised in the Caribbean. So, you know, when you started to talk about St. Lucia and, you know, some Big of the work. Big up to Jamaica. <laughs> oh, <you're laughs> right. Barbados and Trinidad over here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, okay. I love it. I love it, man. I love it. Again, like I, I have a personal passion for Caribbean people and I always love to see Caribbean people in technology and, you know, just being able to, to help push the culture forward with some of those types of things. Mm -hmm. um, just looking in the chat really quickly at some of the questions and comments folks are making. Uh, first of all, I know you all can't see the chat, or maybe you can, nope. but uh, folks are really excited about this API. Like you said, API, and it's just like yes, API. Like I really want to, I really want to be a part of that. So you know, folks are, are definitely into that and want to be a part of, of, of what you're doing there. Um, I know we had a couple folks wondering what's uh, what's little Ian doing right now. I don't know if you could talk about that. <laughs> little Ian, um, I need to talk um, to to check in with his mom because I think little Ian just became a daddy. Oh, he is invited to his baby shower that was scheduled for um, April fifth, but Corona canceled everything because I'm in both, I'm in Brooklyn now. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's very cool. And then you also mentioned earlier about some pilot programs that you're working on with schools and things of that nature, um, yeah. and also some other things that you're doing. Do, are you all um, accepting volunteers, or is there any way that you know the folks that are watching now could be a part of some of the work that you're doing, or even help? With volunteer work or anything like that? Um, yes. If you go to the website, wakandacodecamp.com, mm -hmm. that's like a one page data entry form that I'll, um, you know, I'll take a look at where we've listed is a variety of different possibilities from, you know, everything from, you know, front end API kind of stuff to we really need a whole lot of help on the whole data science and data analytics side. Because uh, you know, we, you know, we use AI, but we have some quality issues with it. Um, even, even folks who want to do um, digital marketing, like we have this, um, the OpenX ad server that we've been sitting and waiting for someone to find, you know, to, to get into that. On the research side, you know, researching uh, some of the notable folks from different organizations, schools, et cetera. You know, so there's a whole lot. Dale can probably speak to. Yeah. So, you know, we have, one of the challenges of, uh, of taking on volunteers is actually take, taking the time to be able to say, hey, what do we need from each of you? Right. Because we have quite a few initiatives that we're in the process of working with. And you know, one of, our, one of the things that we've dealt with is there are a lot of people that get excited, but then they have to deal with their real life jobs, right? So we end up getting people that that are engaged for a week or a day or so, but then, you know, life comes first. I've got my bills to pay. I've got to deal with X, Y, and Z. So we're, we are eager for people that want to participate. We really would love to get some people that want to be historians, people that want to help validate some of the content because we pull in content from what we believe are trusted sources, you know, and we are allowing, if you're a member of Black Facts, you can help create Black history. We have a whole family legacy thing where you can actually start put it, putting in your family legacy and create a page just for your family's history because we've been in touch with 23andMe and a couple of the other um, sites that collect um, you know, demographic yeah. data from people of color. And they're like, you are the platform where people would go to, so can we connect with you? And we realized that all people of color, there was a survey that found that 89% of all people of color actually arrived in a port in South Carolina because that was the biggest slave port. So when they start tracing genealogy, we all go back to there because that was the biggest slave port, you know, in America. And so, you know, the idea of having people that can help us to review content that is submitted by the general public, obviously people that we uh, we can trust as well because we don't want people spoofing or putting in inappropriate content. 
is something that we would love to have people get involved with. Um, you can sign up for things at wakandacodecamp.com. If you go on the website, there is a, a feedback page where you can, you know, just in the subject talk about, hey, I'd like to participate. We are getting inundated with a lot of feedback about our new stuff, and we're kind of heads down. We're tech guys, okay? So we want people that can help us with marketing, growth, and outreach because our strength is the technology side of things. And um, so we're more than willing to engage you. If you're interested and excited, come on board. Great. So we got just about one minute left. Yep. And I know there's, there's tons more questions, and we're not going to have enough time to get to them all. But uh, I'm guessing if folks want to reach out to either of you, they can definitely use this email yeah. address that we're showing right now on the screen, yep. uh, Juneteenth at blackfacts.com. And if folks are interested in volunteering, I saw some folks asking about development questions. People want to know how they could test drive the API before it's out. Like there's tons of questions that are in here. So, you know, before everyone leaves, make sure you take a picture of the screen. Make sure you get this email address, you know, so you can reach out to both Ken and also Dale and ask them whatever questions you have. Um, but with that being said, I just want to thank you both again. Like this was very thought provoking. Thank, thank, thank it, you. Very, very, you have no idea how, how the joy that I'm feeling from having this conversation. Right, for sure, for sure. And, uh, you know, we're definitely gonna have to have a conversation a little bit after this, right? So, you know, maybe we'll, we'll catch up on social media or whatever the case is and, and keep some of this stuff going. But again, yeah, thank you. you, you it right. was important. We just found out, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> Hey, hey, thank you, for everyone that's in the chat that's sending us messages. You know, there's a lot of, you know, clapping and hearts and a lot of love coming off for the two of you. So, again, appreciate y'all. Appreciate everyone that's watching. And then this recording will be available later. So, if you haven't, you know, didn't get to watch the whole thing, or maybe you want to share this with your friends or your colleagues or whatever the case is, make sure you check back to the to the YouTube channel. Um, that'll be shared with probably a little bit later today. And everyone will be able to, you know, rewatch some of this content that we've been sharing with everyone. So thank you all so much. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed like everything you've seen so far. Uh, in the next couple of minutes, we're going to switch over to the closing keynote. And you know, I hope you all enjoy your weekends. And you know, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you for putting this together. Great. This is really fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye, everybody.